Best ever listeners, welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Slocum Reed and I'm here with Brian Underwood. Brian is joining us from San Diego, California. He's the president of Responsible Real Estate, which buys value add multifamily and develops new multifamily in San Diego. Uh, they're currently the GP of 109 units between two development properties. And they have a value add property under management as well, as well as 10 townhomes. And he's an LP of several self storage facilities. Brian, can you start us off with a little more about your background and what you're currently focused on? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time. Um, yeah, like you said, so born and raised in San Diego. So been here 40 years. Uh, I have a, um, a background of the family has a background in commercial real estate. The family does self-storage. So the bulk of my career I spent in our family business, learning the self-storage game, deploying capital, um, you know, really honing my skills on uh, acquisitions, entitlements, everything related to property due diligence, and uh, left that company to start responsible real estate. And now we're in the home building game. So uh, I mean, there's there's a whole host of stories about where I came from and, and happy to dive into those. Gotcha. Coming from self storage, you've decided now, is it, are you developing multifamily or single family or condos? Yeah. Uh, so I have, uh, there's two brands. Responsible Residential is focused on townhomes and some build to rent communities, single family homes, and then Responsible Urban. And that's focused on really market rate apartments in Urban Core here in San Diego. And they both develop, you're developing. Correct. Uh, like affordable housing apartments in urban San Diego? Not, not the technical term affordable housing. It's, sure, um, you know, it's it, their, their market rate. We're not, we're not dealing with, you know, the five different government arms that need to be in the, the, the not pot, talking right, about to rental subsidies finance, or right. anything yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, correct. Correct. But yeah, we're, we're absolutely trying to hit that middle income housing the best that we possibly can. Uh, San Diego and a lot of other places are in a housing crisis. And so we're doing our best to add that much needed product to the market. Gotcha. Brian, let me put a lot of fodder in the cannon here. Um, anyone who listens to real estate podcasts, ours, definitely bigger pockets. Um, what everyone is hearing is that um, it's too hard to invest in California. There's no cash flow. Um, it's the most, it is the most, if not one of the most, heavily regulated um, states for development or any real estate in general. Um, you just can't make money there. You should be investing in the Midwest or the Southeast like me. I'm an owner operator in Cincinnati, Ohio. This is where yep, I live. Yep, right. Um, right. Now that's what, that's the narrative, right? That's sure, what everyone sure. is hearing all of the time. Yeah. Um, so here's, Here's your 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 soapbox or your pedestal. Why why is everyone wrong? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I I actually get that a lot. I look at a lot of different markets, but I'm focused in California, particularly in San Diego. And one of the reasons why I like doing business here is that regulation. Um, the regulation is an extreme challenge, which actually makes it, if you can understand it and navigate it, that's where I can get in and create some massive value for our investors. And so we understand that we have our team uh, has over 100 years experience right here in San Diego that they could get in the weeds, go through that process and actually get product out of the ground. And there's other cities that might benchmark against Southern California, but you show me asset appreciation that compares with Southern California and, uh, you know, that can compare and I'll go do business there. So cash flow, yes. Um, here's the thing is I'm not trying to uh, get rich tomorrow. I I'm trying to create wealth for long term. I'm, I'm trying to create generational wealth. And so as I look around at generational families here in San Diego that have been in the game 30, 40, 50 years, you know what? They own a lot of real estate and they have almost no debt on those properties. And that cash flow is unbelievable. So if, if you're looking at trying to make a quick buck tomorrow, stay out of California, leave it to me. If you want generational wealth and cash flow, and you want to create some massive value, then California is your place. To, to the credit of, a lot, credit of a lot of investors recently, there are a lot of people who, have, um, who, who are talking now about uh, quote unquote, transcending cash flow and looking at the bigger picture and what the assets 
you are buying or developing now will be doing 20, 30, 40 years from now. And thinking about how appreciation and, and, and the trajectory of rent growth is more important for some investors than what they can get now. So that, that resonates. Coming back to what you said earlier, tell me if this is a, if this is a good summary, Brian. Um, California and San Diego and development of new buildings in those areas has a very high barrier to entry, um, specifically because of the high levels of regulation, but also the, this, the, the many moving parts of development deals in general, and you're doing it in San Diego, California. That high barrier of entry means that yes, the vast majority of investors should be going elsewhere because elsewhere is gonna be easier. However, if you have the specialty, the knowledge, the expertise required to surpass that barrier of entry, it creates profitable opportunities for you. A great, great summation. There's a recent article in Globe Street about San Diego housing stock. And when we can literally build 108 new thousand homes tomorrow, and that's just going to meet the demand. You know, we need another 10,000 more this year, and we're probably only going to bring online 6,000. So on average, San Diego, we've got to build 10,000 units just to keep up with natural, natural growth. We, 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 I mean, we haven't built 10,000 in decades. <laughs> so um, right. we, we just, yeah. So it's, it's that opportunity where, yes, it's very, very, very difficult. Um, and that's what we're experts at. Getting them out of the ground, that's, I mean, it's just massive value all around. Gotcha. Let's let's talk about that and what that looks like. First of all, let me ask um, the the vast majority of our best ever listeners are familiar with or even involved in value add apartment syndication. Um, Got you. So now just a little bit. Hang on. We good now? Yes. Good now. Okay, great. I don't know where, um, where the issue is. Let me start that um, question again. Um, Brian, I want to talk about what that value. Let me give Kevin a pause and then I'll. Yep. Brian, I want to talk about what that value looks like. Let's, let's frame the conversation as we get into the numbers. Uh, the vast majority of best ever listeners are, fam are, are familiar with or even involved in apartment syndication of value add multifamily deals. There's a general partnership that structures it. They raise money from limited partners, uh, you know, and deliver on some form of cash on cash return, whatever metrics they choose to use. Um, so let me ask first, have, have you guys brought on limited partners uh, for the, and, and delivered on a return, you know, take a deal full cycle, buy it, build it, sell it? Yeah, the, the townhomes um, that we're actually just finishing up will be the first full cycle for us. So um, that is a friends and family raise. All of our raises to date have been friends and family. This gotcha. is the first time that we're going out as a group and we're exposing us as a group and our opportunities to outside investors. So on the Santee townhomes, as an example, um, that is roughly a five and a half million dollar project. We raised a million five and uh, borrowed you know, for state again. You borrowed yes, for ex okay. ex exactly borrowed for construction loan. And I've, I've, tested Zillow, the rental market. I know where we're going to be at. Those townhomes were actually going to be renting up and selling it as a 10 unit investment property, even though they are townhomes, I can sell them individually. And at what is a four and a quarter cap rate at that value, at the, at the, the rental rate that we think we can achieve that I've already tested in the market, we're at about a seven, three to a seven, five exit on that. So when you look at Okay, I've got a million five. I got five and a half. You know, you're looking at a, you know, in about a little over two year period, we're going to be, um, you know, handing out checks of of double double their cash. You know, two x equity multiple. Two x equity multiple in two years. Correct. That's pretty solid. Um, development is tricky, though. Where? Um, 
And don't and, recommend development for for any for for a lot of people. Okay, it's extremely difficult. Um, very very difficult. There's a lot of places that you can make mistakes. So so don't go out and just try to develop a property. You, you need to surround yourself with people who have done this before, who understand the process that can mitigate your risk because it's extremely challenging every step of the way. I just want to, I want your listeners to know that it's not a, it's not an easy process. Yeah. There, speaking of that, Brian, um, where, where has your biggest learning curve been in, in residential development in San Diego? Uh, the, the, the less poised way to say that is where have you screwed up the biggest and had to learn the most to be as good at it as you are now? Yeah, no, that that's great. So one of the things that we strive to do as a company is to surround ourselves around the best people that we can find. They're, they're like-minded. We're rowing in the same direction. And at heart, they're just good people because no contract is perfect. And the last thing we want to do is have to pull out a contract and sit around a table and say, what did we agree to? Because tensions get high and people argue and that's a bad situation. So what I want to do- there. Right. Yeah, for yes. sure. Go ahead. So it's, this, it's not bulletproof, but what we try to do in every single deal is get around really good people that are going in the same direction that all have skin in the game. Okay, so we have skin in the game. So when tensions get high or we have some problems to solve, I want people around a table problem solving, not saying, you know, what did our agreement say? I think once you say, what did our agreement say is, is like, it's just a lose-lose situation. So let me give you a small example that on the Santee Townhome project that my gut had told me, I want to hire a contractor that wants to invest alongside me in this deal. Brian, yes. I, I want to hear this example, but I want to hear about it. I, 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 give us some of the pain, man. Tell us about one of the times that you did this wrong so that we understand why this is so this is, critical. This, this, is, a, the... this, is, oh, this, this is... is extreme pain. This is oh, okay, the extreme great. pain. Bring I'm it. getting into pain, brother. I'm Good. getting into pain. Good. Okay. So um, th this is, okay. So so I had told myself, right? Because I, look, I, I, I mean, I went soup to nuts on self-storage. I spent out $60 million buying land, a million and a half square feet of storage, right? But I was part of a team and I wasn't signing the back of that check. Once I start signing mm. the back of that check and I'm, I'm cutting the biggest checks I've ever cut in my entire life, I'm reading this contractor's agreement between owner and contractor and I'm scratching my head saying, this makes zero sense to me. Now, people do this every single day. So, so don't get me wrong. This is how Brian Underwood is perceiving this. I'm looking at this saying, hold on a second. If this project costs more, you win. If this project costs more, I lose. I just don't understand how people hire contractors on, on you know, and again, I, I see there's different ways to incentivize them. Trust me. I, I understand there's things. That Is you this a contract there, you had already signed or you're reviewing no, no, before that, you? Gotcha. Th so I was, in, I was interviewing contractors and I, I, I don't like to talk, talk bad about people, but at the, at, I sat down with breakfast and I asked this contractor to invest. I said, you know, it's not, it's, it's not 1%. It's not hundred percent, but you got to put some skin in the game. We got to, I got to make sure that I got your full attention on this project. And he kindly talked me out of it and told me all the reasons why he's not going to invest, but he's going to have my best interest of mine. And he's going to take names and kick butt and it's going to be awesome. Okay. If you ask anybody in the marketplace, now I know we went through COVID. I can go back and connect a bunch of different dots. Right. But here's the thing is I have a contract with him. That's a guaranteed maximum price. And it has an outside date. Okay, this, this project should not take more than 12 months to build. And I'm on month 16. Mm. And I'm not done. It, it cost me $5,000 a day to carry this project. Okay, so this is like extreme pain. Now, thank God, I'm learning a ton through this particular project. And I'm learning a ton about these contracts. And I'm also learning a ton about what I'm going to do different next. Okay, so... If, if, I, if I were to start this project all over again, what would Underwood do? I would go out and pay a really big salary to the best project manager, the best superintendent that has this hybrid skill set. I could pay them a quarter million dollars a year, and I would have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars on my project. And $250,000 a year is a lot of money for this job, even in Southern California. Brian, there are... 
a lot of things that you just said that I want to dive into, two in particular. First, you said there is a maximum um, amount written into the contract that you will pay the contractor regardless of how long it takes. That's a, it's, so it's a, what's called a guaranteed maximum price. And so yeah. um, the, the contract reads as though, here's the price that I could build your project for. And I'm going to do it within this time frame. His profit is already built into a percentage of that guaranteed of maximum price. And so also in addition to that, what we're doing is incentivizing them by, hey, if there's any savings on the GMP, uh, then we're going to split it. So, so that's where he starts making his money, right? Now, sure. um, 16 months later, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be any savings on this project, but you know, there, there might be a couple bucks here or there. Uh, but that's that's really what a GMP, a guaranteed maximum price contract looks like. Gotcha. So no matter how long it takes him now, the amount that you pay is the same. That's correct. Now, the, the, you, you get into nitty gritty stuff. OK, so of here's course. the other thing. Just because you had construction, uh, you know, your your construction drawings uh, permitted by the city does not necessarily mean that any contractor off the shelf can take those plans and build your project. Of course. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of coordination efforts that didn't happen early on in this project. When I bought it, it was entitled. Okay. So big lesson learned when you buy an entitled project, you didn't design it. Someone else did. You weren't in the weeds mm. at the beginning. Someone else was right. So buying an entitled project saved me three years of my life, but at the same time, you look at what I'm dealing with now because it's, it's some plans that really aren't that great. So every time they say this wasn't in our, our GMP, we go back to the plans and say, well, yes, it's right here. This is the, the project that you bid. So it's just this constant tug and pull all the way through the project, which quite frankly, it just isn't fun. If that guy was invested in the project, he wouldn't be nickel and diming me every second. He'd be saying, how am I going to fix this? How am I going to build this for cheap so I can make the most money I possibly can? Creating that alignment of interest on the front end, absolutely invaluable, right? Making sure in whatever, in whatever arena it is, in whatever agreement it is, when there are two parties signing an agreement together, it is abs it's mission critical to create alignment of interest so that both parties who are signing know that they're winning and losing together, 100%. And if the profitability for the general contractor came from your profitability, then yes, you'd have that alignment of interest. And that's the point, Brian, that I'm hearing you make overarching here. I have one other thing about the the guaranteed maximum price. I, as a, uh, a residential real estate agent, represented a very small developer here doing his first deal. And he had negotiated something similar on a project that went way over time. Tell me if this resonates you with you. One of the potential issues with a guaranteed maximum price, especially for a project that goes on too long, if that contractor has lots of projects going on and they, and they realize that based on your contract, uh, their profitability is drying up and they have more lucrative clients to work for, all of a sudden you find your GC prioritizing other people and not coming back to you because they know they're done making money on your project because of the way that it was structured. And, and so you become less of a priority and it, and it furthers the delays instead of hastening them the way that you may have hoped. Brian, is that, is that part of what's happening here? Uh, or is the circumstance of my, my client just different from yours? A little bit, a little bit different, but it doesn't take away from sort of the, the theme that we're talking about is alignment of interest, right? That, that's, that's the theme that we're talking about. That's how you solve, in my mind, that's how you solve all of these problems. So two things that I did that I don't know about your friend, but, but one of them is I, I do have what's liquidated damages, right? That they're being assessed every single day that the project goes on. And two, I've got a holdback. I've got a retainer. So Good. even though they're guaranteed maximum Good. price, you know, I, as round numbers might be, let's just call it $3 million. I'm going to have over $300,000 of their money and which is, is really, it's kind of like their profit. So 
Um, we got liquid so this damages. Is, I, this I is the episode of this podcast that my client should have listened to five years ago, basically, <laughs> is that the, here are all of the things that you could do if you were Brian to make sure that even to make sure that when you're over when you're potentially over budget and definitely over time, here are the things that you can have structured into your contract to still incentivize your GC to get the work done. Brian, can you give us a list here of the ways that you built that into the contract? You were getting into it just now. So, uh, I mean, those, those are the things. So we, I mean, it's a, it's a long, it's a lengthy contract, right? But in short, I, I've got, I've, I've got a fixed price that he's going to build it for. I've got the profit is already established. It's a percentage of that GMP, right? Um, we have some some opportunities for them to make more money. So under the GMP, and, and if we didn't use contingency, we're going to split that contingency. Um, the ways that I, I protect myself are, are really is uh, I have an outside date. I've got liquidated damages out, you know, if we go past that date, and then I've got a retainer. So every time they bill me, if it's a $100,000 bill, uh, you know, I'm giving them eighty-five thousand dollars, and there's a there's a column on our on our payment schedule that says, you know, here's what I still owe them in theory. Uh, but at the end of the day, what you're sitting down is it's you're sitting down. No one wants to go to, no one wants to go to court. So it's just a negotiation over a table, and you're saying, okay, I'm not going to hire an attorney. You're not going to hire an attorney. We have an agreement. Here's what I think you owe me. He's going to say, here's what I think you owe me, and, and you know, it, it, you're going to sort of shake hands and negotiate something at the end of the contract. Um, hopefully that, yeah, hopefully. I mean, that's, that's okay. I, I just, again, I go back to the very beginning and I didn't stick with my gut, right? I didn't stick with my gut on this particular project. My gut told me find a contractor that wants to invest in the deal. It's really hard when you're building 10 townhomes, it's a small project. You're dealing with small consultants. You're dealing with small subcontractors. It, it is extremely challenging. So one of the things that we're doing different is going bigger. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're early stages on an 89-unit apartment development in North Park, which is a submarket here in San Diego. Um, we have a contractor that their sweet spot is building 100 units. We have a contractor that is invested in the deal. They are an owner in the deal, okay? We have some of the best architect and design consultants that you could hope or wish to work for here in San Diego, all excited and pumped to work on this project. That's awesome. Do you, give me just a second. I had a question and I lost it. No worries. Um, man. Okay. Speaking of contractors and general contractors and um, thinking about how hiring so many different third party moving parts can lead to delays, have I want to ask one question two different ways, Brian. Um, have you considered um, bringing some of those contractors in house to work with, for you exclusively in some form? Asked a different way. How big would your company have to be in order to bring in house the majority of the labor uh, involved in developing these townhomes? Yeah, I don't. I'll answer the question saying it, it would probably be about 100 or 125 employees, but you would never do that. You would you 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 can't. As a developer, you need to know a little bit about a lot, right? You can't know a lot about totally. a little, right? You, you, so I, what we try to do is, is what I've experienced with this townhomes with smaller subcontractors, which when we do it again, a smaller project like this, I think I, I had already talked a little bit about, I know all the ways that I would do it differently. And one of the biggest things would be the project manager and the superintendent and the, and the project manager and the superintendent I would like them to have the same skill set. So that's the that's the one person that I would bring on my team. Every one of these subcontractors out there, I mean, I I I, I see the people. I mean, I, I see them. A lot of them are my age, and 
you know, they're working and getting dirty for a living. And I love the fact that they're on my job. And I love the fact that they're working, particularly here in California, because a lot of people don't like to work in California. So I, I want to support them. Like I want to champion them. Right. But there's, there's this sort of attitude on the construction site that everybody points fingers. And I want to change that. I want to bring the person on my team that can change that attitude in the construction industry because we all get up the exact same way. We all have families. We all want to put food on the table and everyone wants to work for somebody that has like kindness, grace, and, and wants to support them. And we all make money. So I want someone who can understand people and understand the job can lay out the roadmap and, and really, you know, get people to do their job and they're excited about showing up. And when they mess up, they say, you know what? I messed up on that. I'm going to, I'm going to fix that for you. Right. I, the, the going through a project where no one takes ownership of their work is brutal. And I don't understand how construction industry is like that, but I want to fix it. I want to do it differently. Absolutely. Brian, are you ready for the best ever lightning round? So lightning round, is it, is it literally lightning or, or can I elaborate? <laughs> well, uh, yes. Uh, both. Yeah. Yes. What is, yes, both, what is the best ever book you've recently read? Well, it's a Bible, man. Come on. You know, it's a Bible. The, the Bible, the, the Bible. Do you yeah. have a preference on translation? Uh, I like the new uh, living translation, the NLT. NLT. Gotcha. Yeah. What is your best ever way to give back? So we connect every one of our projects with a local nonprofit here and however we have a percentage that we carve out of every project and so when we finish that project when we sell that project when we do a deal whatever the case may be it, they, they they get incentivized there's a lot of different ways time treasure talent but we do it with financial resources this current deal that's in month 16 who's the nonprofit for that one a fellowship of christian athletes oh okay nice we, we touched on this uh, already. Uh, tell me if it's the same answer we've already discussed. What is the biggest mistake you've made in residential development? And what is the best ever lesson you've learned resulting from it? I'm, I'm going to pick something else out. Okay. Because, Great. because awesome. we did, we, we, we talked about that, but so recently I almost lost my bottom on a deal. Okay. This was a, I had four homes in escrow I ended up being three. We had 38 units designed. I'm going through preliminary review, hiring consultants. I'm like, I'm at like $70,000 at this point. Like it's not coming back. And I get a letter, okay, from one of the homeowners that says, uh, we're not in escrow anymore. And I'm thinking, well, you, you can't just you can't just do that. I mean, you understand it's a contract, right? Um, yeah. So I, I'm like reviewing my contract. I'm like, okay, you know, your attorney is crazy here because yes, we are very much in contract. Um, so instead of, instead of going to mediation or fighting this guy, I thought, okay, what's a way that I can get out of this deal and still make some money? And there was a homeowner, one of the three that still wanted to make some money. And I thought, you know what? We could take this on as maybe a fix and flip or a value add, but even better, I found someone who does that for a living, which I don't. I don't do fix and flip like single family homes. Gotcha. And he paid us. We, we basically just wholesaled it to him and made a quarter million dollars. Nice. So I, I, yeah, happy I didn't lose money, but that was the one I was going to lose some money on. Real quick, what's the mistake and what's the lesson there? Um, well... I think the mistake is part of the game. The mistake is part of the game is uh, I, I think there could have been a better communication with the homeowners on, on gotcha. exactly where we were and what we were doing. And I think that's huge. And in, in any sort of extended escrow that you're in is communicate. You know, sometimes you think I don't want to tip my cards. I got to keep them close to the chest. Look, we're all people communicate with your seller, let them know what you're doing, let them know when you're spending, you know, you're sweating and you're spending a lot of time and effort and you're spending your money. And uh, I think that would have uh, helped us out. Awesome. And Brian, what is your best ever advice? Uh, best ever advice. Take the next step. So uh, what, what, yeah, what I, what I, what I think, and, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, this is like, I, I'm talking to myself, but I also see it with friends and family and a lot of other people is we, we project out and we say, here's where I want to go. 
and somewhere along the way, whether it's fear or something else, gets us to just stop and say it's, it's too much or I can't do it or somebody told me I can't do it. And it's like if I got 20 people in the room and I asked them, hey, what are you after? They'll, they're going to tell me. I said, OK, what's the next immediate step? They could tell me what that next immediate step is. And so do it. And then think about what the next one is. And so a month from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you keep taking that next step. You're going to be doing some pretty cool things. Awesome. Where can people get in touch with you, Brian? Yeah. Investwithbrian.com. Investwithbrian.com. And that is Brian with a Y. And the link is in the show notes. Brian, thank you. I feel like there are so many different ways this conversation could have gone. Uh, if we had two hours, we definitely would have filled it with great conversation. Best ever listeners, thank you as well. If you've gained value from this conversation about the real estate development game in a market like San Diego, please subscribe to our show. Leave us a five-star review and share this with a friend that we can add value to through this conversation as well. Thank you and have a best ever day.